So it's really incredible how far Blender has come the last few years. In this video, I just want to take some time to walk you through the latest project I was working on, show you the tools I use and the workflows I use, and generally just have a good time chatting about Blender and art. So the first thing I did was to go ahead and make a previous or an animatic of my animation. So I knew which action I wanted the main hero card to do. So I animated that along a spline having it do this baby driver drift. Um, but then I didn't know how would the cameras be, how would the cars be. Uh, so I tried some different things out just by roughing out some camera animations, some camera angles and with some blocks that would represent the different cars that my hero car was interacting with. And this really helped me illustrate what I wanted to do. So to be able to make these camera cuts, what you can do is press M while hovering here in the timeline, then select any camera and then hit control B. So that would bind that camera to the marker. And this is super useful when you want to basically outline which action you want in your sequences. And another tip is that you can also add an audio track to your scene. And the way you do that is simply just open up a video sequencer and then the sequencer here and then hit add and sound and then you can load in your track. So when you do that, you get a little audio track. You can offset it however you want. I obviously try to make the car into the scene on the beat. <laughs> So even though I used another audio track in the end, it still made it flow much better that I actually had this track in the beginning to base everything on. So to animate everything, I used Launch Control. That's a tool that I've been developing the last year, just trying to make a better workflow for animating cars inside Blender. So the way you do it usually is that you draw a path that you want the car to follow. Then you have this wheel that's spinning above the car, which will make the car be pushed along this path. Then apart from that, you have a drift slider or a drift handle here in the back. You can make the car drift and everything is following automatically. You can notice how when the car reaches uh, uh, more than 45 degrees here on the steering, it will automatically lock the steering. Stuff like that is just automated when you're using launch control. So recently I also added a drift bone or a drift offset bone. Basically it allows you to offset the entire car so you can see how the rear of this car or the tail is sort of continuing straight while the front is slowly going off to a side here. And you can see how this is possible using this offset bone that's slowly being animated down. So with this, it goes all the way to a full spin and then it starts going back the other way around. And as it goes back, first the tail of the car goes back around, which is exactly what I wanted. And then in the end, when the tail is 90 degrees around here, the drift offset bone starts to push the entire car towards the line again. If I were to do this with a simulated approach, trying to control the car with arrow keys, you can imagine how hard it would be to actually get it right. But on the other hand, it probably would be more fun. So it's up to you. There are a lot of good tools out there, but this is the tool that I like using for stuff like this. So the next thing I did was to start to build out an environment. The good thing was that I knew that most of the action would take place in one intersection where you have the cops trying to block our Subaru from getting through this intersection. So I would put the most energy in making this area, which could be reused later on. I was talking to one of my friends who made the add-on called HDRI Maker. It's a super cool add-on and it actually lets you take an HDRI map and put that onto geometry. So what I did was using his tool to take this HDRI map and then first of all project it on a sphere and you can see this is how it's running right here. So this was what I did and you can see how most of this stuff here, in the end I converted it into polygons and then I added a few extra details. But all of this stuff is basically just an HDRI map that is projected. So that means I didn't have to do much of the work. I just had to add in a few assets here and there to fill in the empty spaces. But you get so much for free if you use this sort of approach. So as you can see here, this is the first rough lighting and modeling of the entire scene. And everything is sort of in here without as many details as needed in the end. And you can really tell when the illusion starts to break. But in most cases, all this is really enough to sell the effect. So with all this extra stuff modeled, I had one scene where I was refining the animations. I was starting to add in stuff like tire tracks and um, or skid marks that are generated by launch control. And again, some parts are still not fully animated, but I was trying to take it one step at a time to slowly get closer and closer to the finish. 
So at this stage, I had everything in one file. And at some point, I like to split it into separate files. You can see here, before I had all the cameras called 10, 20, 30, 50, 60. And the reason why I call them 60 and not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is in case I need to add a camera in between, let's say 6 and 7, I would have to call it 6.5. And that's a really bad name for a camera. So that's why it's a really good idea to just call them 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Because if you need to add a camera in between, you just call it 65. And you still keep the correct sequence of names or numbers, I suppose. So I like to split it into separate files, as mentioned. So in this case, I had shot 30, which was the first one I attacked. Because this is sort of the overview or this little intersection. So this was the first one that I tried to push as far as I could. Um, and it was also a place for me to try to find out which sort of lighting and which sort of mood I wanted. I use a tool that I was building myself called uh, RenderSnap. So what RenderSnap does is that whenever you hit Control Alt S, it will just snap your viewport and save it here to your image viewer. So right here, it looks a little bit too dark. The reason for that is that I'm using Aces in the project. So that actually messes up the Blender viewer a little bit. But if you look in your folders, RenderStep also saves to a, to a folder on your hard drive. You can see how we started out with this lighting that looks very weird, very bright. It doesn't have much uh, contrast. And through the process, I was trying to make it softer, make it more, more like a beam, more contrasted more focused on this cop car and it's also a way to play around with different color grading and stuff like that and in the end I got something that looked like you can see here again I felt like it was too yellow so in the end I had something that looked like this uh, where I was going into compositing and trying to figure out the rest so that's just the way I like to work to sort of develop a look and then go from there. So another example of a, of a scene that I changed a lot. I really wanted this truck to go crazy. Like I was imagining the cop cars completely out of control. They just wanted to catch this guy, no matter the costs. So this guy, he literally jumps through a gate, uh, trying to get in front of our uh, hero car and block his path. So that's why I wanted this gate just being slammed open. And the way I did that was using some constraints in Blender. You can set up a hinge constraint and then you can use the built-in physics to just simulate stuff like this. But this just comes to show how launch control doesn't really limit you when it comes to extra physics. It will just become a part of the simulation. So launch control has the animation and whenever you do any uh, bake the launch control physics, they will just be baked on top of the other physics that are in the scene. So everything sort of works together. And you can see here the result. The, the gate is slammed open and the stuff flies all the way to the other side of the street. And this guy here is very surprised about what just happened. So fun stuff like that. And you can see how this scene here I actually stripped out a lot of the other geometry that we didn't need anyway, just to save rendering time and performance. Instead, I opt in for getting a very high quality uh, curb here at the bottom because these small details really help when you want to render something this close. So always just add in the details you need for the specific shots. And that's also another reason why I really love to split my scenes into different files so I can optimize everything for the exact view that I'm working on. So since this was a drifting animation, I of course wanted some effects to go on top as well. So the first of the effects was the uh, skid marks that I was trying to figure out how to do for cars. I always wanted a solution like this uh, and I actually ended up figuring out that you can do it with the new simulation nodes. What I did was that I built this function and then I later on built it into launch control so everybody can use it. And another approach that I found for generating smoke is, uh, is using a particle system because simulation is cool, but it can take a very long time. Most of the time you don't really need it anyway for stuff like this. So this rendered will look something like this. Of course, it doesn't look as good as a render or a simulated solution, but it's good enough for most cases. And especially in this case where I just needed some smoke that I could add in in some certain shots where it could look really nice. So when it came to rendering, I had a few issues along the way. First of all, I was trying to do this project really, really fast. So I was trying to make a general lighting setup that worked for everything. So you can see this is what I'm showing right here. And it doesn't really look that pretty, to be honest. So I spent a long time for every single scene, edit and adjust the lighting so it looked more like what I wanted. So I would get more focus on what mattered in the scene and also get these nice colors in the end. And one thing I also did add was a volume atmosphere to the entire scene. So basically I added a big box and then added a volume shader on that with a very, very low density, which just adds, adds this sort of haze effect. 
And again, I could have done it faster if I did it in compositing, but I did want to have a sort of fast solution that could just render and uh, I didn't have to do so much in post. So you can see a bit more of the iterations here and you can see how it really just is a lot of hard work and trying to get it to look better and better for every single pass and indicate what is the issues in the scenes that you want to fix. And some scenes that I really liked were these ones in the end with uh, with these extra cop cars kind of sliding in there because it was just fun to animate these things. So when it came to rendering, I ran into some technical issues just with memory. Because the thing is, the HDRI map I used in this scene was very high quality. It was 16K. And for many scenes, it just simply wasn't possible to render all that because it took too much memory. So one thing I was using when I was doing all the previews was inside the render tab, you can hit down here uh, to simplify and then turn on texture limit. So this will limit all the textures in your scene and I would usually limit them to around 2K so I could render everything in real time and then see how it looks. But for the final renders, I of course wouldn't want to limit my textures. So you can see here it had no limit. So instead I used an add-on from Polygonic that is called Memsaver, which just helps you identify which textures and objects and meshes take the most memory. And then you can reduce the quality of those or completely remove them if you need to. So this was a very neat little tool uh, to use for that. I did have some issues with it, but overall I haven't seen another tool that can do it. So if you are in memory issues, then do check this out and see if that can help you. So when it came to compositing, I did most of the stuff inside After Effects. The reason for that is simply that I know the tool quite well by now, uh, but I do wish that I had started out in Nuke instead. So I actually redid the, the first shot of the film completely in Nuke and was really loving the process. But for now, I will still show you how I was doing it in After Effects. So what I like to do is start with my filmic pass, or actually this is an Aces pass for Blender. From Blender and then build on top of that. So a pure linear workflow would be better and that's what I would use in Nuke but After Effects is still not that good for linear workflows. What I like to do is to separate my uh, different multi-layer multi, multi -layer passes uh, that I think I can use for different stuff in compositing. So I like to use the AO, I like to use the diffuse indirect and direct to just, again, get closer to what I had in my head. So I even sometimes add in just black masks to darken certain areas, brighten certain areas, and stuff like that. So this is all my different passes added on top of each other. You can see I really wanted to brighten up this area around the car to get focus and also increase the, the glow here from the, from the lights. And with all that on top of each other, this is the final composite with all the passes. And then on top of that, I added some different glow effects and color grading. I soft matted the image itself on top of itself to get a little more contrast and then uh, a little bit of vibrance and sharpening in the end. So this is how I got to this result. Uh, and you can see the before and afters. If I flip all this off, then you can see this was before. And this is with all the effects enabled. In the end, I took all that and brought it into DaVinci Resolve, which is the tool I like the most for editing my videos. And just cut everything together. I would cut off a few frames here and there just to get it to match better. And then again, you can add a little bit of retiming or whatever you need inside Resolve. But generally, I didn't do so much here other than just editing the video and the sound together. And that's basically it. So there's a lot of stuff I would have improved on the project if I gave myself the time. But at some point, you also just gotta say that your vision is decently accomplished and uh, get it out into the world.